Herzlich willkommen. Welcome, everyone. Ich freue mich, Sie alle begrüßen zu dürfen. Thank you to one and all for attending today. Good afternoon. My name is Peter, Peter Hoekstra, and I'm your host in the upcoming session. Um, welcome, everybody. I see more people stepping in, so um, I will make a slow start. Let me check if the audio is clear. Yes, that's right. And yeah, so today we are talking about, within, of course, the conference of the future of Europe, we're talking about the eight workflows. And uh, but before I dive into the topic, I just want to set the scene and help you to, uh, to understand how the agenda has been built up. Um, so let me give you a quick overview of the agenda. As you have seen in the Zoom event platform, three sessions that you can join. And um, so in the first part, in the first 50 minutes, I will give you a short introduction. And, um, and I will, of course, explain like what is the problem that we are going to solve or what is the problem or the challenge that we are facing together. In the second part, Jan van Bonn will explain the missing gap. And you will also understand why it is so important to standardize with, for example, unified service management and, uh, and especially the, the architecture that's behind this service management method. Um, the last part, um, which starts at five o'clock Brussels time, because I've seen people from different places, not only from Europe, but also from uh, Vietnam. I saw people stepping in from India, welcome, from Canada, from the United States, and uh, but also here from Belgium, the Netherlands. Um, I see people from Germany, and uh, so yeah, it's good to uh, to have you all in this session, Sweden as well. And um, yeah, welcome. But um, before I, um, I finalize with the agenda, I was talking about the final session, which is at five o'clock Brussels time, where you all will have the ability to communicate with us because now we are broadcasting and talking to you. And from five o'clock, which is within an hour from now, we will change the dynamic and you can talk and ask uh, questions to us, bringing your situation so that we can um, explore together what needs to be done in, um, in this time, in this challenge where we want to make the digital transition. Um, okay. While people are stepping in, I will um, make a, um, a start yeah, with, uh, with the introduction. And first of all, as I said, what is the problem or the challenge if we look at the future of Europe? Well, we will become more and more dependent, more connected society. And this also reflects on our organizations, not only of today, also tomorrow. Um, yeah, but what does it really mean? Well. Today, many organizations are suffering from, let's say, inefficient connections within their organization. Think about different solutions teams that are trying to get things solved and organized. But also outside your organization. If you look at your suppliers, your partners, most of those connections today are solved, how? By email or an Excel with data uh, or a meeting. Um, yeah, uh, an online meeting, uh, I should say, nowadays. So we know cooperation, working together, is key. And most of us will do it in a network of several organizations or um, with several teams within an organization. And what does it require? It requires standardization. And we have seen this evolution already in the production of goods, uh, standardization, is a big topic uh, within the European Union, but how do we solve, how do we solve this in a service industry? Um, well, we found out that any, so, so, um, any service organization um, always contains the following five processes. And uh, let me walk to the flip over over here, and um, 
What I have prepared for you are those five processes. And in any organization, you will recognize these five processes. Sometimes they are mentioned in a different way, um, but they all have to do with that you want to agree something, um, that you want to change something in your planning, and, uh, and then you start to operate, then you start to execute it. And if something goes wrong, a failure, um, then you have a process, some organizations call it incident management or recover, um, so that you can bring it back to the agreed service level. So this process model with five processes, you can look at it in three ways. And um, one way is by going through the processes like agree, change, operate. And as I mentioned, if something goes wrong, you need to have um, a process that helps you to recover. And, um, and there's an improved process as well, number five. Improve is like quality management. Improve is for those that are familiar with problem management. They say, if we see repetitive failures in the organization, we need to do something from a problem management perspective to, um, to solve it. And, um, but also, risk management. Several organizations, uh, also in the banking organizations, um, you see uh, risk management um, another one pops in, innovation management. So the way I have all kinds of different processes in organization, well, it is confusing. And I, I see several organizations having different processes like risk management, quality management, innovation management, problem management. But wouldn't it be far more easier if you start to look at it as improve? It's all a matter of improve and risk is the trigger that comes in when you do the balancing act and make the decision, are we going to do something about it or not? So there's one way to look at this model from a process point of view, as I told you. The second way is there is a kind of reactive part in the model, and that's where you see the customer here as well. And, um, and there is a proactive part where you, within your organization, start to do something indirectly for your customer. But let's just first have a look at the reactive part because it is triggered by a customer. So you have what kind of triggers? Well, there is a trigger that a customer would like to have something, a wish that needs to be transformed in a kind of agreement, a contract. And uh, so that's a trigger. A customer can have a wish. Uh, the second one is the wish is already transformed in a contract, in an agreement, and the customer experiences a failure. Something doesn't work. That's another trigger. It needs to be recovered. Or everything works fine, and the customer has an additional request which fits in the service. And uh, so the service request comes in, and those that are um, planned and organized and ready to execute all these service requests within Operate will do so. Um, and of course, within the contract, you might would like to uh, change something. And, um, and if it is a good contract, it's also very good specified what you can change. For example, yes, I would like to make use of the trucking facility and, uh, but instead of four trucks, we need five trucks. Is that possible? Yes, within the contract it is foreseen. There's, of course, an additional price. You make the change and it will be, uh, it will be uh, communicated to operate and, uh, and the, the fifth truck is ready for you. So that is, from a trigger point of view, the reactive side. The proactive side is that you trigger within your organization, for example, mm, that supplier that we have, we, we need to think about another one. We, we have suffered from too many issues. Um, we need to change that contract. So then you are doing an, an, a new agreement, that was what I was looking for, with a different supplier. So that's on this level. You can also change something within the agreement that you have with one of your partners. Or 
a small service request that you would like to bring in your organization, uh, which does not reflect your infrastructure, those elements that you need to run your service. So that's the second way that you can look at the process model. So the first one was that you recognize the processes uh, that any service organization has today. And the second way is that you look at it from a trigger perspective, reactive and proactive. The third one, that also reflects to the title of our event, the workflows. What are the eight workflows? And that's why we build it up from a trigger point of view, because what you see here is the number one, the number two, three, four, and five. That are the five reactive workflows. And on the other side, you see six, seven, eight, and that are the three other workflows. Um, in the second part of our conference, we will explain a bit more and show you those workflows as well. Um, but just to get you already a bit familiar how it looks like, let's um, take the first one. So a customer has a wish. So the workflow starts here, and the first um, actions, um, or the, I should say the first activities within the process of agree, uh, like accepting the wish, classifying it, uh, building up um, the specifications that are uh, mentioned by the customer, making a kind of draft agreement, and then going into the organization, and you start to use activities from other processes, and that's how the workflow looks like. So what you will learn by using unified service management is that you take activities from this process, activities from this process, you go even deeper and check with operates that if we are going to transform this wish into agreement, do we have time? And it could be that those over there say, yes, it is possible, but not from the 1st of January, move it to the 1st of February. That feedback goes to change, they will put it in there and provide this information to the one who is running this workflow, go back to the customer and will be signed that the service agreement or the contract will start on the 1st of February. That means that thanks to the workflow, you go deep into your organization and it's not only the technical resources that you look at if you have enough availability, but also from a human point of view. So that's one of the way, um, uh, one of the workflows that I uh, wanted to show. A very short one is workflow number five. A customer already has a contract and just wants to do uh, a quick service request, uh, asking, for example, uh, can I have this specific software on my laptop um, within the next two weeks? Yes, it is part of the agreement. You can download your project management software. There's a small price in it, which was already agreed up front, and the service request will be fulfilled. Okay, three ways to look at the process model. I look at the clock, and uh, we're almost uh, there, um, 15 past four. And the whole idea here is not only that you learn to look at the process model in three ways, but also, and that's what I will do in the second part, uh, in the second session, where I will um, interview Jan van Bon, to understand why it is so important to embrace not only uh, this service building block in your organization, but also several other building blocks that helps you to build up your service management architecture. Um, before I make the switch, I will look in the chat to see if there are any questions out there at the moment. And um, okay, so we're doing fine. And I see already more people stepped in. For those that missed the beginning of the introduction, uh, no problem. We will make a recording available for you. And, um, and it's also for the second part. Um, so that makes it also uh, possible for you to share it with others. Okay, thanks for uh, listening to this part. Um, that means that we will move now to the second part how those eight workflows help you transfer, transform. So you need to move out of this session and I see you back in the second one. Thank you. Yeah, Jan. Um, let me um, slowly introduce you uh, so that the other people can, uh, can uh, go from one virtual room to the other virtual room. And then uh, Jan, yeah, um, we... Um, we know each other already quite some time, but that's also what you see in the service management domain that you um, 
uh, get in, stay in touch with a lot of people that are trying to, uh, to understand and get their finger uh, behind the whole service management challenge. And, and I also know you um, are based on the, the books that you wrote within uh, the domain of service management. And uh, yeah, Jan, maybe if I look back to the first part, the introduction, where I spoke about the, the model with the five processes, um, let me see. Why haven't we solved this, this gap, this, this huge challenge that we have in service management? I, I trained many people in, in one of those practices, also within the, the European Union, Digit, uh, in ITIL, for example, and we, we are missing something. Um, help us out, Jan. Yeah. Yep. Now, uh, one thing is sure, it keeps you off the street. And there's lots yes. of customers <laughs> that, that have been uh, benefiting from this. But, but of course, that's not a sustainable model. If you look at the future of Europe, then we simply can't go on the way we did. And that, that actually comes down to an old saying of, uh, of Einstein. Einstein says, if, if you have a problem, and I think uh, service management in practice is really a problem. It's a huge challenge for, for decade upon decade. Einstein said, if you have a problem and you, you look at the way you came to have that problem, then solving the problem cannot be delivered by doing the same thing that created it. So mm. he simply said, if you do what you did, you get what you got. So if we yeah. consider this economy a, a problem, a challenge, to getting control of things and we're working hard and we're repairing and repairing. It keeps you off the street, as I said, but that's not a sustainable solution. Then we should absolutely uh, rethink everything we've done and we should find another approach. It's a different approach. Einstein clearly says, if you do what you did, you get what you got. So if you wanna solve this, you must do something in a different way. Now. That, that is the starting point of an analysis that leads to uh, the nice pictures that you've already showed us uh, in the introduction. Yep. Um, I think if you, you really pinpoint the issue that is the wrong approach, then if you look at the 30 years that we've been working in service management for now, everything we've been doing is based on practice-based frameworks. Yeah. If we continue to do that, we will see, uh, let's say, an ITIL version 5, an IT for IT version, uh, I don't even know what number that is, COVID version 6, 7, 8, or 9, mm -hmm. off, et cetera. Yep. And we will continue and continue, and it will keep you off the street, but it will, again, not deliver a sustainable solution. So that is something that we obviously have chosen as the approach that has not delivered the results that we expected from it. And that is, I think, the, the description of the society and economy that we are in now. As you said, we live in a connected yeah. society. Everything we do is connected. If you pull a string, you've got no idea of the things that will fall over if you pull it too hard without overseeing the effect. It is a huge sea of ripple effects that you can't control because it's, everything is connected to each other. If you look at how we cut everything in pieces, we live in a fragmented society, not just in a connected society, but also in a fragmented society. Uh, we do a software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, everything as a service. We cut it into pieces and we put it on a distance in terms of outsourcing, everything goes to the cloud. So we live in a connected and a fragmented society. And that creates a huge complexity. And yeah. on top of that, we are totally dependent upon each other. There's no organization anymore that can do something completely by himself. We are totally dependent upon the contribution of others yeah. in our delivery of value to whatever customers we have. So we have a complex society based on dependency, on fragmentation, on connectivity, et cetera. And that is something that can only be counteracted not just by creativity, because creativity can't assure continuity. It simply demands some level of control. You can't just yep. leave it to, uh, to chance. So we must get in control to be able to deliver everything we promise to our customers. 
and, and we promise yep. service. We promise a value to our customers. And without an approach that is based on control, we will not be able to deliver that. We can't do it by just uh, focusing on control. We also have to do it by focusing on creativity of the people that we've trained and that we use in terms of uh, uh, creating nice things and, and working together. Yeah. But one yep. of the, uh, the tracks that we definitely need to address is control. And that requires yep. some kind of a, a fundamental uh, approach that we all embrace. There must be some kind of a fundament below everything we do together. Otherwise, we will never be able to work together, to cooperate, and to, yep. to solve the interoperability issues that we are trying to solve these days with a lot of money and effort. So yeah, we're looking yeah, for yeah. a fundament. So maybe I should make this picture a little bit bigger, where you talk about these three elements uh, with interoperability in the center. Yeah, interoperability is, is the, the thing that we need because if you understand that everything is, is fragmented, everything is related to each other in a connected society, and we are depending upon each other, then we must learn to cooperate in an efficient and effective way. And that means that your individual contribution to the value creation of the network or the supply chain must be under control because so many others are depending upon your contribution. Well, that means we have to focus on some kind of a control approach to solve the interoperability challenges of the future. Yeah, but you're also saying getting in control of your services is so important today. And uh, I would like to go deeper on that as well. And, um, and another thing that reflects on me is uh, what I also tell an organization is like, if you want to have time for creativity, time for innovation, it's so important to standardize. And um, yes. uh, because then you, you can do things in a controlled, successful way. And, um, but on the other hand, you also need to, um, to be creative and to, uh, to innovate. But I go back to the question, why is getting in control so important today? Well, that, that actually reflects the level of dependency. If we are totally dependent upon each other, then you must be in control of your contribution. And the only thing uh, modern organizations do is to deliver value to another party. Everyone yep. has turned into a service provider role. And the idea uh, of the, the late 1980s that goods transitions were the dominant economical uh, approach that is yep. so 1980, that is so Porter. Yeah. Then Porter described that nicely in his, his fishbone uh, model. But that is so 1980. We nowadays live in a service dominant logic and the era of service. Everything has been turned into a service. Every organization tries to uh, create as long as possible relationships with the customers to make his turnover and to, to deliver the value that the customer uh, is seeking. So. Service dominancy says that mm. the only thing we do is to deliver some kind of value to someone else, some other organization, yep. some other people or whatever. And that simply cannot be done without control on the factor of interoperability of each of these actors in the supply chains or the supply networks. So that again, it, it is kind, as you said, standardization is required. It's some, something like, uh, let's say, freedom in capt captivity. Yep. You, you so, seek the freedom, but you cannot do everything on your own way because then you won't cooperate, you won't be interoperable anymore. So there is some level of captivity. And that is where standardization kicks into the game. Yeah, yeah. So we need a kind of shared um, fundament or yeah. a fundamental foundation, a basis to enable the interoperability. Uh, but we cannot without it anymore. But um, but what do you really mean with this fundament? How, how does it look? Well, that, that is a kind of a concept. For instance, if you um, translate this to, we all want to create the puzzle of the future and the puzzle of all yes. the, the, the countries and all the organizations in each country, we are a huge puzzle. If you want to become a puzzle, each of the organizations that contributes to that economy must realize that it is a piece of a puzzle. And a, a puzzle piece, yep. you know what a puzzle piece looks like. It's a standardized yep. format. Of course, there's variation, but it's kind of a standardized format with bulbs and holes so you can fit into the yep. other. That, that idea, um, I think that is the idea of a fundament. And 
Maybe you can translate the idea of fundament also to your company as let's say a building. Uh, you yes. have a huge building and, and in each of your floors, you do all your business uh, activities. And of yep. course we are continuously focusing on redecorating each floor because new technology is so seductive. We must follow new technology in floor 10 or 12 or 15 of the used building that we manage. That's the thing we focus on day by day. No yep. one focuses on the fundament that should yeah. have been there before we put all the attention, all the money in the floors. And you yep. know exactly what happens to a building that has no solid singular fundament. And then a hurricane hits it. Let's say a hurricane in terms of we're getting a new manager or a new yeah. law hits us, or we are yep. uh, doing a reorganization or we are changing our tool. That's, yep. that's what we call hurricanes. And yep. if hurricanes hit the organization, you must have a clear fundament for all of the floors that you do business in. And that's the thing that yep. has gone wrong. As Einstein said, if you focus on what you're doing in your floors and you're not completely sure of the fundament that you created below that, well, then, of course, your building will collapse. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's and how... And how can you elaborate on this one if I demonstrate my organization, um, like the picture here, different uh, links in a chain, um, not standardized, like uh, a building, uh, if I go to your example, where there is no foundation, um, how can you solve that? How can you make this chain stronger? Now, this is a nice example of uh, what, what people see as a supply chain, where each of the actors in the supply chain, which can also, of course, be a supply network, each of these yes. actors is choosing his own way of delivering value to the whole system, the whole chain. And yep. you know the proverb, the chain is as strong as the weakest link. And, and for everyone, yep. it's clear which of these links is the weakest one. Um, one, for example, yeah. this one here. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one. That's the weakest link. Yeah. So there's always a weakest link. If everyone determines how he contributes to the, the yeah. value chain, then there always is a weakest link because it's a, a, a summary of all kinds of links. And the effect is that this kind of supply chain never delivers a sustainable result because there always are weakest links. So the only way to create a solid and sustainable value chain, a, a supply chain, a supply network, is yes. by some level of standardization. I think you, you okay. must have, yeah, that's it. And that's the, the, yep. the idea of a solid supply chain. And just imagine if you're hanging on the edge of a cliff by either one of these chains, which yep. one would you put your life on? It's obvious yeah. that everyone would choose the second one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's your intuitive answer. If I'm depending with my life on either one of these chains, then of course I will go for the second one. That's your intuitive uh, response. But it's not always true. And it requires something. Because yeah. let's just imagine that the second chain is made of paper. And you would definitely <laughs> prefer the first one. So that's a uh, prerequisite that the elements of this chain must be strong. They must not be of yeah. paper, they must be of, of uh, a, a heavy metal. That's the first requ uh, requirement. Um, it must be strong. And second one, it must be simple because everyone must be able to act as such a link. Well, that's not the difficult part in here. The difficult part to get organizations and uh, countries or continents yep. like Europe to cooperate is that you can't force people into the format of a link unless it's acceptable for them. And that means that you yeah. cannot interfere with the internal business of such a link, which is only a component in a supply network and in a, on a country level. So yep. if we want to come up with a solution for this concept of the link, this fundamental idea of how to solve uh, complex systems, then it must be easy, it must be strong, and it must absolutely be acceptable for all players. Yep. That means that yep. you can only focus on the outside, 
you can't interfere with decisions of those organizations that reflect an internal uh, decision. For instance, how, how do you want to be organized? I can't yeah. force that upon organizations. Uh, or let's yeah, say that... the tooling you choose. I can't force yeah. you to, to just, uh, um, let's say, everyone should uh, choose ServiceNow. It's the dominant tool, so I can freely uh, take it as an example, but there are plenty of organizations that don't agree with that. Now, yeah, you yeah. can't force people to select certain tools. You can't force them to create a, a standardized organization model or whatever. That's entirely mm. up to them. So whatever standardization you apply, it must refer to the outside of the link. And yep. that is yep. the thing the link produces, the thing the link does. And as I said, we live in a service dominant era. So everything each of these links does is deliver value in a service context. Now we are okay. all service providers. So it should focus on how you deliver your service. That's the only way to standardize. Yeah, yeah. So that means that um, if you do not want to force people to, uh, to use, for example, a specific tool, they need to, to use something else when several organizations work together um, in a supply chain or, or supply network, how can they work better, faster, cheaper, easier together? And um, yeah, that, that is applicable and, and also an acceptable way for them. Because on one hand, you would like to give this standardization um, um, more emphasis, but the other hand, you also would like to keep them uh, a kind of freedom on how they do things. Absolutely. Do you have a picture in mind that helps us uh, to put this all together. Yeah, every solution that is really simple and really effective must uh, be, uh, you, you must be able to, to comprehend that in one simple image. So of course, there is one simple image that, that uh, tells the whole story. And that story, as I said, is about delivering your service, delivering the value you produce in the network. So uh, you probably have a, a great uh, image on screen for me. Yeah, this one. This, this is um, an image yep. of service delivery. Everyone knows what service delivery is. Huh? It's a relationship between a customer and a service provider. And the provider provides a service. So the first thing that we need to do to create interoperability of this link uh, in the whole network is to standardize the definition of what a service is. If that is not defined in terms of Lego, then you cannot create integral service, end-to-end -end service from sub-services. And you, everyone knows Lego, uh, the small plastic blocks with uh, pads on top and holes in the bottom, they fit into each other and everyone can create their own building, their fantastic uh, fortress with the same blocks. Only yep. your imagination is the limitation here. So the standardization of the Lego block idea applies to the concept of what a service is. And a service always is something that is produced by a provider and that creates value for a customer. Otherwise, yeah. there wouldn't be a service of, of any value. And the service composition, if you want to make this manageable, the service composition is always the same. It always is something that's made available by a provider to a customer. So the customer can do something more than he could before he took the service. Mm -hmm. Plus the fact that there is a continuous relationship between the customer and the provider that requires that the provider supports the customer during the time they have an agreement. So any yep. service is a facility and the support that comes with it. And any, any facility, the things that the customer is getting to improve his business, the facility is always a composition of goods and actions. Now, if you look at the hairdresser, it's mostly actions. If you look at the teacher, it's mostly actions. If you look at the telephony service, the yeah. machine is a, a good a phone or whatever. If you look at IT, a lot of stuff is visible and tangible, but a lot of stuff is intangible and uh, expressed in terms of actions. Yeah. Well, that is yeah. the standardization that is required for this concept of a link to be acceptable, uh, effective, strong, and also uh, guarantees the idea of a Lego block. So if we define 
all our services in terms of supported facilities. And we can easily set up service agreements because they all have two yep. chapters and two paragraphs per chapter. Yeah. That would enable us to, to communicate much better in terms of what service are you providing. And the services can be added to each other in terms of piling up the Lego blocks and creating an end-to-end -end mm. service from the perspective of the customer. So this so, idea supports the idea of Lego. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what, what, what I like about it is that you provide, I could say, uh, surface building blocks. Um, and I really like the way that you express what is a service today, because you're right, we are moving away from, from goods where um, the service action becomes the, the, no, the dominant part. I, I, I realize it here also in my office, if I order something, uh, even if it is paper for my printer, that the final part, the delivery, the service act uh, is the, the crucial one, otherwise I still cannot print. And uh, so the combination of both, uh, and also if it goes wrong that I have a phone number that I can call, um, yeah, you're right, it's, it's a strong combination. Yep. You and, uh, but this is only, but, only one component. The, the service definition must be Lego. The second yes. component in this image refers to standardization and uh, not of the results that is provided by the provider, but of the provider himself. Those providers yep. must act as links in the supply chain. That means that the interfaces of those providers must be connectable, interoperable. That's the whole idea. And this okay. is where- Okay, so this is how it looks like. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. This way as links in a chain. But if you look at the, the let's say the, the bulb, the, the red uh, circle of the provider, then you yes. see a system. And system thinking has taught us that if you decompose a complex system into components, you can uh, focus uh, as much as you want on each of the components, but it is the, the combination of the components that delivers the value. So in this case, it's not the people that provide the value. It's not the activities that provide the value or the tooling that provides the value. It's the combination of people doing things with stuff, the daily routines of the service provider. Those routines deliver the supported facilities, the service that is uh, delivering value to your customer. So yeah, you want I, like that, I like that phrase, people do things with stuff. It, it, it's, it's like one sentence explaining this whole picture. That's the shortest um, to make it. <laughs> yeah, uh, just yeah. like the, and, the shortest definition of a service. A service is a supported facility. That's the shortest and most powerful yeah. definition of a service you'll ever find. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. So and we are looking uh, for routines. If you want to be in control of what we do as a provider, we are looking for insight into the routines. How do we create a sustainable set of routines that guarantee yeah. the interoperability between the providers? as links in a supply chain. That's the yep. challenge. Well, that's where the model that you already described on your flip over uh, kicks into the place. So on company level, as, uh, as well as solution team level, it works uh, in the same way. You just need to connect with a focus um, on your goals because that's also what the management uh, system does with the people process and technology but how does it relate to your to your practice to your daily routine because you, you use uh, in the end um, a, a way to deliver your service i think and um, yeah that's, that's that is exactly what what einstein actually referred to with his, uh, his proverb uh, there is something that has gone wrong in in decades for at least three decades the thing we did is that we haven't been getting in control of our routines. We've only been getting in control of uh, loosely coupled activities. That is the practice-based yeah. focus that we have taken for three decades. And if you uh, understand what the difference between a process and a procedure and a work instruction is uh, in practice, then you can get in control of the routines that you must create to deliver guaranteed value. Well, this is, these are the only resources you have. You've got people, you've got the things yes. they do, and you've got the stuff they use. Those are the only three resources any organization has to create their daily routines. And if, if you just look at the process, yes. remember, this is just about what a process is not about who. 
or how a process only describes what. So it's the sequence of activities with a predestined uh, output. That is a yeah. process. <clears throat> and of course, a process output must be customer relevant. Otherwise, you're not at the mature level. So if okay. you describe a process, and actually you can also describe, uh, let's say in Excel, uh, just a column like you're showing. On top of it, you say what, and you just list the activities. And that is the column that explains how the processes are constructed. But if you yep. now want to know who is the person that I've made responsible for the activity, then you get what we call a procedure, which is nothing than just a, another column in Excel. And for each activity, the Excel says, the service desk manager can do activity two and only the director can do activity 10. Now that is the relationship between the who and the what. That's what we call the procedure. And the procedure is derived from the process. And because what you do comes first, then you choose the people to do it. And if you then- This is already a big breakthrough, I think. And there are so many organizations discussing about process, procedure, yeah. and- uh... A huge misunderstanding. Because yeah, yeah, process yeah. is just what. And people misuse, they abuse the term process for anything they like. So if you now would like to add a prescription for how this director should do activity 10 or how the change coordinator should do activity six, you get yes. the how added to the who and what, which is uh, getting us a work instruction. And it's just the third column in the Excel. So now yep. we have demonstrated that every work instruction, which actually is the practice that you are doing in terms of delivering your value, every work instruction is derived from the procedure, which is derived from the process. So that means that if we don't have a clear picture of the process architecture of our service organization, then we yep. are in the chaos that we are now in. It also means, yep. and if you look at Einstein, it means that if you want to solve that, you should go back to where it went wrong, and that is in the definition of the process. Yeah. If you are yep. looking, well, well, yeah, well, please go ahead. Well, what I really like about what you are building up here is a much stronger definition of what you agree internally uh, in your organization, not only about what do we understand, uh, what is a service, but also what is a process, what is a procedure. So you are really building up uh, a very clear uh, terminology set, definition set, uh, yeah, maybe a governance uh, around um, how to deal with services, which is something that we, I think, completely forgot to build up in organization. We moved um, from a production goods industry, uh, copied like lean and other practices and say, okay, we will do the same for running services. But what I really like is that you emphasis on those building blocks that are so necessary to have, as you said earlier, better control uh, on your services. That's it. Yep. If you don't understand yep. each other, nice. of course, uh, the frameworks like, like I told in COVID, they have uh, helped us to, to uh, let's uh, clean up the language that we use, but they have made some serious errors because they didn't deliver the things we expected from them. And this is one of the things they went wrong. Yep. The definition of the process, the term process has been abused for anything in terms of uh, capacity management, infrastructure management, security management, uh, supplier management, any level of uh, practice detail has been uh, used with the term process, which of course is not a process because it's a technical application of process people yeah. technology. So all those examples are definitely on the lowest level of this uh, image. They are on the level of the generic work instruction. So yep. that's fine. And a lot of guidance on that level is absolutely uh, desired by, by anyone. We could use uh, good guidance there. But if we forget where it came from, if we only focus on the practice and we forget the principles that should have led to the practice, then we are emphasizing yep. the chaos that we live in. And that's where we took the wrong turn, as Einstein said. Now, yep. I've always learned that if I take a wrong turn, I should go back. Yeah, I yep. the wrong term and then do it again and now good. Well, that's what so the ES is process about. model, yeah, so that ESM, uh, USM uh, process model is quite fundamental. Yeah, that uh, is the thing where everything starts. So if you want to create the ultimate uh, uh, yeah, origin 
of all these practical ways of doing things in terms of work instructions and practices, then you must yes. create yourself the optimal, the ultimate process model. And an ultimate process model is integral in terms of it covers everything you ever need to do in terms of service management. It is also yeah. integrated, which means that everything must influence each other because it is a system. And the third thing, and that is unique, you must make it maximum efficient, which means it must mm. be non-redundant. There must be no activity incorporated more than once. Otherwise, you have redundancy, and everyone knows what redundancy creates. Inefficiency. Yep. So we must have an integral, integrated, and non-redundant process model. The search for this simple process model took us 30 years. Yeah. Because and so from here, you can build up the workflows. Yeah, from, from here, uh, if this is the most simple reflection of the term process that applies to any situation in any service organization, in any line of yes. business of any size, whether you are a small team or an individual or a, a multinational, it doesn't matter. So if you follow up on the logic of this simple process model, you will run into the fact that there are only five reactive workflows in terms of the logical sequences of the components of the process model. Yep. In terms of proactive, there are only three proactive workflows that are uh, allowed by the logic of these uh, wonderful process modeling components. And that means yep. that any organization in the world, in any line of business, in any service setting, and everyone is a service organization now, can automate its daily routines based on this simple set of eight workflows. So all you yep. need to do is to reconfigure your tool with just one module, a workflow module, and reflect yep. eight templates. And there's a second module that you'll need and that, that will hold the, the register of your managed infrastructure. And you must make sure that these two are interacting nicely. So yeah. that is the, the tool of the future, a simple, cheap, yeah. most effective tool uh, that, that is not near all the stuff that's on the market now because it's all too complex, too expensive, and it doesn't yeah. do what you need it. You all need and too many different workflows. Yep. You get uh, all kinds of workflows. They are totally redundant. Just look at yep. the, the whole idea of service value change. It's totally redundant. It doesn't help you in getting uh, in mm. control of efficient measures. What you need yep. is simplicity, non-redundancy, integrality, and, and in, uh, everything must be in there. Non yeah. But I, I think um, in 10 minutes, um, we have the interactive part yeah. and we will definitely get questions, uh, I think, regarding this topic, because uh, there's a lot in what you said, and especially when you make the step to, um, to tooling and automation, um, because then you can use, I think, these workflows in a, in a more um, kind of decision flow, uh, which can be uh, even far more um, uh, efficient for those that are trying to automate those routines. Um, but just um, um, also to bring in a couple of examples, um, maybe on country level or even on, on, uh, on European level of large networks of organizations that need to work together with the same understanding, because we, we are all dealing with those challenges. Do we have some examples? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is what we are doing now in the Netherlands. This was created in 2016, made available in 17, and we've been working with that in, uh, in, in all kinds of lines of business, all kinds of companies, healthcare, government, every, everything you can come up with uh, yes. for four or five years. Then we translated it to English, and the last year, or the beginning of this year, we started making it available to uh, countries outside of the Netherlands. So we've got a lot of companies that apply this, but more importantly, we need to challenge things at a nationwide level. So the, the big problems in the Netherlands <coughs> currently refer to things like uh, we need a nationwide system to manage healthcare data. And yeah. this is something that happens in every country. If every organization, every healthcare organization uh, defines its own data and uh, duplicates it, we got a totally redundant system. Nobody knows where yep. the, the, the real data is. It's inefficient, it's chaos, and every country in the world is fighting that chaos. So that's what we in the Netherlands are trying to do to uh, make 
clear for nationwide cooperation networks, that they can all use a simple uh, definition of a link in terms of a standardized management system and a standardized service definition. So they can mm -hmm. all solve the interoperability. And it's not just in healthcare, it's also in government data. If you look at civil data, uh, each yes. ministry is managing all kinds of data sets, each municipality is managing data sets, all kinds of providers are managing their own stuff. So the redundancy there was overwhelming. And every organization of every country in the world, I think, is currently fighting that. Yeah. So in the Netherlands, we've been uh, working with the USM, USM approach, the Unified Service Management yep. approach, the, the, the concept of the link with a, a standardized management system and a standardized service definition. And that is now being adopted uh, in our national, our government. national government. Okay. Now in the national government, and this, this of course is a Dutch side where the national, uh, the, the reference architecture of what, what we use in government uh, servicing is described and, and in all lines of business in the Netherlands, we have a localized uh, applied model for this reference architecture that is made uh, to fit every line of business. This yes. is now being redesigned and Dutch government is now using the ideas of the unified service management thinking, the ideas of a link, and this is where you recognize the concept of the link, but now in yes. a government service setting. And where yeah, nice. and companies decide about which services they do. They are represented in uh, the, the chamber of uh, the, the ministries, etc. And they, all, they agree on laws and regulations that must be operated on the ex executable level. So in municipalities, in provinces, in ministries, they supply the, the agreed services to the inhabitants of the country. So that is the whole customer provider relationship model. And this yep. view on service delivery uh, on the level of Dutch governance is now being redefined. And this is entirely based on the concept of the link as described in the unified service management method. Nice, really nice. So, uh, um, yeah, if you look at the Netherlands, we, we clearly are a service country. We have not, not a huge uh, production uh, economy. We have a service economy. So we, we need to be smart. We need to be dealing and wheeling. And we, we need to make profits from uh, negotiation and, and uh, trafficking and things like that. Yeah. So yeah. In, the, in a country like the Netherlands, this idea of creating interoperability in complex networks on a nationwide scale is now uh, setting off. I think in time, in a couple of years, and this is uh, going to be spread to all of the lines of business in all kinds of uh, companies in the Netherlands, I think this will give us a serious head start in terms of improving our economy, the efficiency of our economy, but also the quality of our economy. Yep, yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and I see it already happening uh, in several uh, municipals or townships um, in the Netherlands, where they ask for, uh, on one hand, understanding um, more about what is shared through uh, Nora, the, the governmental website, where they uh, standardize a lot of information for um, um, for a lot of municipals and but also other governmental organizations. Um, and what I like about the fact is that it's all uh, also now available in English. So even organizations outside the Netherlands, companies, um, but also governmental organizations within Europe um, can now easily step into the material yes. and, and build up their own standardization and, uh, and create on one hand uh, freedom, but on the other hand, embracing a kind of architecture. Now, Very exactly nice. That's what, yep. uh, what this is going to do, because it, if you have uh, all this knowledge in government, of course, government shares this uh, throughout the, the country, but also between countries. And so we're now offering information to other countries from the Dutch yep. government. But uh, the nice thing about this whole knowledge model is that it's owned by a non-profit organization. And that means that, that this is not a, a commercial initiative. This is 
purely based on sharing knowledge and improving yeah. society with better knowledge. That means that the Service Foundation, who owns the, the IP on the whole idea, is supporting not just uh, experts in the field with toolkits, et cetera, et cetera, but also trainers and also uh, public education institutes to make uh, yep. free e-learning environments available for students. And I think last year, something like a thousand students have been studying this knowledge yep. in their regular programs. So in, in 10 years time, we hope that everything is solved from within. Because yeah, it's focused nice. on public yep. education. Yeah, I personally was involved in a training program here in Belgium, uh, Odyssey School, where one of the teachers uh, started to train their students, uh, well, quite a large group, 50 people, um, where we used um, uh, my robot and start to learn how to connect this unified service man uh, management uh, model with all our practices. And uh, yeah, that was nice learning for, um, for them. And they were also fast. They were quick in building up the importance and necessity of, of having those definitions. And uh, where I see companies suffering um, when I start to discuss with them about what is a process, what is a procedure, and what is a work instruction, for students, it goes like this, and they say, of course. And uh, so they, they don't have to uh, de-learn, or how do you say it, uh, uh, that they can easily build up and, and pick it up from, uh, from there. Yes. Yeah, they don't need to unlearn what we all have. Yeah, unlearn, that's the word. Yeah. Yeah. Learned yeah. in the three decades that we took the wrong turn by focusing on practices, while we actually should have focused on the principles of the methodical approach towards the practice. And the practice yeah. is great, but we can't have a benefit from them, full benefit, if we don't know how to create them in a solid, sustainable way. And that is what USM yeah. is going to solve. So USM is additional. It's an add-on. It's just a fundament that was always missing. That's the gap that we're talking about. Yeah. All the floors are still there. But now, with a good fundament, we can improve the quality of the floors. Yeah. So it serves yeah. the whole building, the whole organization, the whole country. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and and within that same metaphor, um, by having this same foundation in several buildings, it even becomes far more easier to network because you understand each other much faster. And, uh, and what I've what I've recently seen um, when I was supporting an organization in Norway, uh, by having this same understanding um, in one organization. And, and the same logic in their partner organization, it was also easier to connect their both uh, tooling because it was totally different tooling, but they had the same understanding thanks to unified service management. And it was also helpful. So there are yeah, several ways how you can benefit from uh, using and embracing this method. I'm, I'm looking at the time, Jan. Um, yep. Thanks a lot for uh, explaining uh, and uh, guiding us through um, the, the models, the building blocks, and, uh, and also the big why um, we need to, to, um, to fill this gap together. And um, um, well, what I suggest is that we step out and, um, and then we come back in, um, in, the, in the last session. And, uh, and then we will change from, uh, from webinar to a meeting session, which gives all the participants the possibility to, um, to interact. And uh, so instead that you have to listen to us, uh, we start to listen to you. And, uh, and please bring in your, um, your, your um, uh, personal or I should say professional situation or a country situation so that we can see um, what is necessary to, uh, to help you out to move on and, uh, and to learn from this methodology. Okay, thanks a lot.